at 9.50 and 45 seconds, Coordinated Universal Time, on the 14th of September, 2015, a signal was detected by the LIGO detector in Livingston and 6.9 milliseconds later in Hanford. It was a chirp signal that lasted just over two-tenths of a second. When we route the wave into a sound generator, here's what it sounds like. This plot combines the data from both sites. The waveform is consistent with coalescing masses with a 10 cycle 200 millisecond in spiral that gives us the frequency, the rate of change of the frequency, and a peak wave amplitude. A merger that takes around 2 milliseconds. And a ring down as the coalesced objects cease to radiate gravitational energy. Detector noise introduces errors into all the calculations based on these figures. That's why we'll provide a range for each item. The amplitude and frequency data points give us the luminosity distance. It is important to note that gravitational waves experience redshifting as they travel across the cosmos, just like light does. Having traveled around a billion light years, this wave would have experienced a redshift near 0.1. So the frequency we see here is a bit smaller than the frequency at the start of the wave's journey here. The frequency data also gives us the chirp mass. Taking the redshift information gleamed from the merger and ring down portions of the waveform, we get the binary system masses. These masses are too large for neutron stars that are only a few times the mass of the Sun. So we must be witnessing the merger of two large stellar black holes. During the last 200 milliseconds of their in-spiral, the orbiting velocity of the black holes increased from 30% the speed of light to 60% of the speed of light. Over the same period, the distance between the two black holes went from around 1,000 kilometers to just under 200 kilometers when their event horizons made contact. Modeling the final ring down shows that the mass of the resulting Kerr black hole is around 62 solar masses. That's three solar masses less than the sum of the masses of the two inspiraling black holes. This mass was converted to the radiated gravitational energy. In other words, during the final 20 milliseconds of the merger, the power of the radiated gravitational waves peaked at about 3.6 times 10 to the 49th watts. Let's take a second to get a feel for how large this number is. In our How Far Away Is It segment on nearby stars, we found that the Sun converts 4.26 million metric tons of matter into energy every second. The resulting power output is equal to 4 billion hydrogen bombs exploding every second. The Sun is an average star, so we can use this as an average stellar power output. From our segment on local superclusters, we saw that there are 250,000 trillion stars within 1 billion light years. This represented around 7% of the total number of stars in the universe. We get the total power emitted by all the stars in the visible universe by multiplying the average watts per star times the number of stars. The power generated over the last 20 milliseconds by this merger of two stellar mass black holes is 26,000 times greater than the combined power of all the light radiated by all the stars in the universe over that same period of time. That's the signal we saw in September 2015, a billion years after it happened. Here's this event's place on the sensitivity graph. You can see that it's well within the sensitivity area, covered by LIGO. We have used the wave information to find the energy, wavelengths, and masses involved, as well as the distance to this event but the wave information does not tell us in which direction it came from, 
because each interferometer is a whole sky monitor with very little directional information. But having two detectors does give us some directional data. For example, if the wave came in parallel to the line between the two sites, the signals would have registered at the exact same time. If the wave was perpendicular to the line, we would have seen a time delay of 10 milliseconds because the wave travels 3,002 kilometers through the Earth at the speed of light. What we detected was a wave that came in at an angle that caused a delay of 6.9 milliseconds. The dotted line represents the distance the wave had to travel for a piece of it to reach the Hanford interferometer. A little trigonometry gives us the angle. But with only two interferometers, this angle gives us a circle of possible directions, not the single direction that's needed. Now, there are four such gravitational wave interferometers. In addition to LIGO's two, there is Virgo, located in Cassina, a small town near Pisa, Italy, on the site of the European Gravitational Observatory, and Kagra, located under Mount Ikenoyama in Japan. Its test mass mirrors are cooled to cryogenic temperatures. All four work together to cross-check each other and pinpoint gravitational wave source sky locations. Combined, they have detected over 90 gravitational waves so far. In this graphic, each circle represents a different black hole, in blue, or neutron star, in orange. The half-blue, half-orange circles are compact objects whose classification is uncertain. The vertical scale indicates the mass, as a multiple of the mass of our Sun. The arrows indicate which compact objects merged and the remnant they produced. We'll cover this one, the most massive, in the next segment.